like a movie, just like a storybook. We are the future, we're the ones they won't overlook. It's time to be the hero. Good morning, and welcome to Faith United Methodist Church. My name is Mike Cassidy. I am the pastor here. It is my joy, my privilege, and my honor to welcome us into worship on this, the third Sunday of Epiphany. It is a joy to be with you here today. It's a beautiful weekend. I am excited for what God is bringing to this community in the coming days. I'm excited today for the Chiefs to play. I'm glad that that uh, Patrick Mahomes is back on the field. I'm also excited. Um, our council met last Sunday and approved our COVID team's proposal to go ahead and begin to worship in the sanctuary again. Um, so we're going to actually have two live worship services next Saturday and Sunday. That's the 30th and the 31st. Saturday evening will be in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. And then Sunday morning will be here at 10 a.m. And we'll also be streaming again live at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. Now, here's the thing you want to know. We do have limited seating still. We're limiting to 60 people. Um, so the best way to make sure that you're registered to come and worship is to go ahead and fill out our Sign Up Genius. The link will be released here um, on Facebook tomorrow on Monday, and then also we'll go out on Faithwire on Wednesday. And also you can call the main office and let Julia know that you'll be here. You can leave a message if we're not in. She'll make sure to get you on the list. Please don't be afraid of taking anyone's spot. Just um, go ahead and sign up, and that way we can have a good sense of who'd like to worship in person. Also remember, though, that we will be masking. So um, all of us in the building will have masks on the entire time. We have been blessed um, not to have any incidents of COVID spread here at the church, and we want to keep it that way. We want to do our best, and so we're stepping into this, into this cautiously, um, optimistically, and willing to do, and, 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 and encouraged to do the best for one another and the best for our community going forward. So we hope to see you here. We hope to worship with you here. Again, we'll still be online, and you can still worship the same way on Facebook and on YouTube that we've been worshiping in these past uh, months. As uh, But a new day is dawning. We're coming back together. Disciples Assemble is our um, sermon series right now. It's our theme, and so we indeed are going to assemble. If you have any questions about this, please do. You can call the office 9 to 2, Monday through Thursday, and we'll try to help you out. We want to make sure that we do things in the easiest, best, the most helpful way forward. Speaking of assembling together and doing things together, um, we're going to assemble with the Howard family as Ken Howard opens us in prayer today. Ken? The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. Perfect light of revelation as you shone in the life of Jesus, whose epiphany we celebrate, so shine in us and through us that we may become beacons of truth and compassion, enlightening all creation with deeds of justice and mercy. Amen. And amen. And now we want to let everybody know that we're here. We want to celebrate your presence here today. We want to celebrate the presence of our neighbors, our friends, and our family. So in the comment section below, if you're here on YouTube or on Facebook, I want you to go ahead and type in all caps, ASSEMBLE with a big old exclamation point showing us just how excited you are to be a disciple of Jesus Christ assembling together today. I'll see you right back here in just a moment. It's that time to move in to worship. And so we are going to prepare our hearts and minds to worship Jesus Christ. We're going to welcome in the light of Christ. Ken and Kim Howard, they're going to lead us in a call to worship. 
And Ken's also going to read some scripture for us. He is part of our leadership and nominating committee. And so we're excited to, to lift him up and share with you those who've been charged to raise us all up in leadership in the church. Sky and Allie are going to lead us in song. And then we'll close um, with a prayer. So I invite you to lift your voices, sing along, speak along. The words are on the screen. Let us worship God, our Father. Please join me by sharing in the call to worship on the screen. Our souls find rest in God. Our hope comes from Him. He is our rock and our salvation. We will not be shaken. Trust in the Lord, O oh, you people of God. Let us pour out our hearts to our rock, our refuge.
Christ Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin itself to cease. Just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus. Let us give our attention and our hearts to God's word. This is Psalm 65, verses 5 through 8. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy are you of all our praise. And so we praise you today. We lift your name upon high. We turn our hearts, our gaze upon you. And in thanksgiving, we come to you for all the wonders you have wrought, for all the gifts that you have given for the love and the grace that you have shown to us, your people. Lord God, continue to bring us back 
for all those places that we have strayed, for all those times in our lives where we get sideways. Lord God, bring us back to you. Correct our ways. Make straight our paths. Help us so to see your light in this world that all else grows dim. Lord, in a world fraught with division, bring us, bind us together. For the losses that we have suffered, may we remember the eternal life that you have offered, the promise that you give. For those who are sick, bring healing. Lord God, our nation reels under a pandemic. Heal us, O oh Lord. May this vaccine be of you, and may a healing be upon us. And Lord God, help us to trust. In a world where trust has been broken in so many places, help us to trust in you and the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ. He taught us to love, taught us to live, he taught us to pray these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I want to remind you that we are a praying congregation. If you have a prayer request, a joy, or a concern, or would like to receive our prayer list, you can email Julia Houston at admin at valleyfaith.church. Julia is our office administrator. If you mark those as general, they'll go on that email to prayer list. If you mark them as confidential, they'll just go to our care team, which is a small group, five or six people, and myself. We lift you and our people in prayer each and every day, and we invite you to join us. Now, speaking of prayer, we have been praying for a different school each week of the school year. This week, we are praying for Blue Springs High School. I want to invite you along with us to pray for the faculty, the staff, the administrators, the students, the parents, that they might feel loved, that they might feel grace, that they might feel some blessings in this time, and they might be able to trust those in whom their trust depends in this strange and wild time. I also want to thank you for the ways that you give and for the ways that you share your love for this congregation and for this world, but mostly for the ways that you share your love of Jesus with those around us. We could not be the church without your gifts. If you'd like to give online, you can do that. Just follow the link in the description. If you would like to share um, an offering at church, you can do that as well. Just bring it in, put it in the mailbox outside, drop it off in the office, nine to two, or mail it to the church, and we'll make sure um, that you too are counted as among those who support and lift up this ministry. You don't just support um, financially, but you support with your presence and your gifts. And so let's share in an offertory. And as we do, take this time to give yourself over to Christ. <laughs>
we're gonna go to Katie Kiarte. She is our kids director and she's gonna bring for us a kids moment. You gotta hear this story. Katie. Hi kids and faith families. It is good to be here with you on this Sunday morning. And today I wanted to share a story with you from the book of Jonah. And it is a story about reluctance and hiding. So reluctance is kind of a big word. And what that means to me is when you are reluctant to do something, you don't really want to do it. And you might try to find ways to get out of it, or you might hide from that, or just shy away from it. So sometimes God asks us to do things that we are reluctant to do. But if he asks us to do something, what we know in our hearts is that he is going to be there to help us do that. So a story I want to share with you about being reluctant or hiding, kind of hiding a way to cover something up that you might not want to do, is a funny story from our oldest daughter when she was about three years old. So I'm going to show you some objects here. Hopefully you can see a little pair of like manicure scissors and a brush. So these two items, if you put them together, sometimes can lead to something bad. When our oldest daughter was about three, she cut her hair without us knowing. And she was re reluctant to tell us. So what she did was she hid these items and she hid the hair that she had cut and thought that we might not find out or recognize that, but we did. And everything was okay, just hair, right? It was all okay, but she was reluctant to tell us and she was kind of trying to hide that from us. So that is similar to a book in the Bible about Jonah. And God told Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And there are people living there that are acting mean and they're being wicked. And I want you to go there and tell them to repent and I will save them. But Jonah didn't want to go. He was scared to go there because the people were not very nice and he didn't, he didn't want to do that. So what he did is he caught the first ship out of town and left and he hid at the bottom of this ship. So he was reluctant and he was hiding. And he was hiding at the bottom of the ship thinking that God wouldn't find him. But we know that that's not true, that God always sees us and knows us. So God sent a storm that tossed the ship around because he knew Jonah was on it. And there were other sailors on this ship and they said, Jonah, what's going on? This is unusual. So Jonah said, well, I'm hiding from God and I think he might be upset, but maybe if you toss me over, the storm will stop. So the sailors tossed him over, hoping that the storm would stop. Well, the storm didn't really stop, but it got worse. A huge, great big fish came and swallowed Jonah. God sent this fish that swallowed Jonah. And he was inside this fish for three days and three nights. But while he was in the fish, he prayed and he thought about what he had done and he confessed to God and repented and said, I will go to Nineveh. I will do what you asked me to do. I'm ready to do it. So the fish spit him out and Jonah went to Nineveh and he told the people to repent and change their ways and they were saved and everything was okay. So sometimes we're not always ready or willing to do what we think we feel in our hearts or we know is right in our hearts. But if we're listening to God and we trust him and he has a plan, we can't hide from it. And if we just step out in faith, he will step with us and take care of us. So today I would pray that if you are feeling reluctant about something or you're hiding from something or not sure about something that you feel like God wants you to do, ask him for courage and ask him for strength and he will be there and he will help you out with your plan and with his plan. So I hope you guys enjoyed that story. 
And if you want to join me over on the Kids Connection page for our Sunday School lesson today, I will see you there. Thank you, Katie. We are continuing our sermon series called Disciples Assemble, looking at the ways in which Jesus called Assemble his disciples. Last week, we explored a moment from the Gospel of John that provides kind of a, a paradigm for how Jesus calls people to himself. Follow me, he says. And how we are, call, are called to invite people to Jesus. Come and see, and then you too may follow him. This week, we are back in the Gospel of Mark, and now that we have our paradigm down, we're actually going to jump back in time a little bit. We're going to hear Jesus call his first disciples. And as I was preparing uh, for the sermon this week and reading the scripture, a word from the Common English Bible translation just kept coming back to me again and again and again. And that word is trust. And so as I read to you from Mark chapter 1 this week, I want you to listen for trust. Not, not only the little, literal word, trust, it's there, but I also want you to listen for how this scripture causes us to consider the ways that the disciples needed to trust, but also maybe the places in our lives where we need to learn to trust. Again, maybe even for the first time. And so this is Mark, it's chapter 1, it's verses 14 through, six, for, through 20. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee announcing God's good news, saying, Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. As Jesus passed alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me. He said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Now, right away, they left their nets and followed him. And after going a little farther, he saw James and John, Zebedee's sons, in their boat repairing the fishing nets. At that very moment, he called them. And they followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired workers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord God, we do seek to follow you. We do seek to leave those things behind that would pull us down and follow you in all we are and all that you say we should be. And so Lord, speak to us today like you spoke to those disciples so long ago. Give us a word that calls us to a new life. As in your holy name we pray. Amen. Trust this good news. And so what is the good news that we are to trust? What is the gospel? That God's kingdom comes. I mean, Jesus tells us that. That the kingdom of God has indeed come near. That Christ was and is and ever shall be with us. Emmanuel, God with us us. And so may Christ reign in our hearts now, as he will one day reign over his kingdom on earth, as it is in heaven. Amen. But it can be hard to trust this gospel that the kingdom has come near. When we look around us, or we look on the news, or look at our lives, look into our hearts, and it feels as if the kingdom is nowhere near here. I mean, unless you're talking about the chief kingdom. That's real close. This past week, with trust on my mind and on my heart, I, I couldn't help, I, I revisited one of my favorite movies. It's Miller's Crossing. It's by the Coen Brothers, and it's an old one from 1990, but the subject is, is even older. It's a take on 1930s gangster movies, and the opening scene is brilliant. John Polito plays Italian mob boss Johnny Casper. And Johnny's upset because his bookie, my favorite name ever, Bernie Birnbaum, 
Bernie Birnbaum keeps tipping people off that Johnny is fixing fights, and that cuts into Johnny Casper's paycheck, his payoff. And, and so he gets upset and he opens the film, he says, this is an issue of ethics, he said, an issue of trust. And then this is my favorite line. He says, it's the wrong situation. It's getting so a businessman can't expect no return from a fixed fight. Now, if you can't trust a fixed fight, what can you trust? If you can't trust a fix, what can you trust? It's a beautiful paradox. It's a great setup for the movie. If you can't trust a fix, what can you trust? It is this lack of trust that leads to the car chases, Tommy gun fights, explosions, and love triangles that make Miller's Crossing such a good movie. But it's one thing to lose trust in an illegally fixed fight in the 1930s at a time when the levels of trust, by the way, in the United States were about to hit their highest points ever. It's an entirely different thing to live in America today when the levels of trust in our country are at an all-time low. Here are some statistics, some numbers from a 2019 Gallup poll about trust. They found that 17%, one seven, 17% 17 of Americans trust the government to do what is right. In 1958, that number was 73, 73%, now it's 17%. 24%, just 24% trust the criminal justice system. 28% trust newspapers. 18% trust television news. And you might be thinking, well, thank God I got religion. Thank God I got something I can trust. But only 36% of people in the United States trust religious institutions. Ouch. But at least we're not Congress. Congress is the most distrusted institution in America at 11%. Now that was 2019. I don't even want to know what the numbers would be if they gave that survey today. I mean, we don't need a survey to tell us where our distrust of political institutions has gotten us. I mean, that was on full display for the world two weeks ago. Our distrust of science and, and the medical fields, vaccine and masks, anyone? Or how about trusting our neighbors? I mean, how many of us even know our neighbors these days, or at least know them enough to trust them? What about trusting a stranger? I mean, all I gotta do is roll up at some weird hour, ring your doorbell, and just wait while you hit the floor and army crawl to the door before pulling yourself up and peeking out the peephole to make sure I'm worth opening the door. We don't trust the doorbell. Don't even get me started about the hundreds of tiny and not so tiny hurts and betrayals we've all experienced from people we look up to, people we thought were our friends, loved ones we thought loved us. We've all had reasons to lose trust. I mean, who can blame us? We've all given others reasons to lose trust. Who could blame them? And then here is Jesus bursting onto our scene saying, now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust the good news. And that's the beauty of Mark's gospel, by the way. The urgency of the language in this rapid-fire story leaves us with the impression that every time we read these words is the time, the perpetual now. Now is the time, Jesus says. Now is the time to trust. And I'm thinking, now, Jesus? Like, trust now? You want me to trust the news now? Have you seen the news lately? I mean, we can't even trust the news when it's telling us that we can't trust anything. And what's more, in the translation of, of Jesus' words that we're more accustomed to, Jesus says, repent and believe the good news. The same words that John the Baptist used when he called us to prepare for Christ's coming. Repent 
for the kingdom of God is near. And we know we're trusting the good news got John the Baptist, right? I mean, it's right there in the beginning of our scripture. It's the reason this was go time for Jesus. John, we read, was arrested. We know then John was beheaded. And it's like, you want us, Jesus, to trust the good news that got John the Baptist killed? No. <laughs> now is not the time, Jesus. 2020 wasn't the time, and judging from the way it started, 2021 is not shaping up to be a year for trusting either. I, I think that's why, actually, the CEB translation of Mark hit me so hard this year. We're more accustomed to hearing Jesus and John the Baptist call us to repent. But I think the problem is that we've lost the true meaning of the word repentance. I mean, if you just Google the word repent, and the first definition that pops up is this, to feel or express sincere regret or remorse about one's wrongdoing or sin. To feel or express sincere remorse, to, to be sorry. But, but here's the thing, I mean, Jesus isn't just telling us to be sorry for the things we've done. Jesus isn't just calling us to apologize. Jesus isn't even calling us to go to confession. The word repent in Greek is metanoeo. Metanoeo. Literally, it means to change one's mind. To change one's mind or purpose. To think differently. To be different. So when Jesus calls us to repent, he really is calling us to change our hearts and our lives, like the CEB says. And I'd go one more, change your hearts, your lives, and your minds. Jesus is calling us to turn. That's another part of repent, metanoeo. To turn, not just from the things you know are wrong, but turn from some of those things you thought were right that you may be desperately wanted to be right. And these days, if we're going to begin to trust again, and we as a culture, as a society, as a people, I don't think I'm alone in saying we desperately need to trust, to learn to trust again. If we're going to learn to trust again, we're going to have to change our minds about some things. We're going to change, have to change how we feel in our hearts about some people. We're going to have to change how we go about living our lives. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. Trust. In the Greek, the word is pisteo. It means to believe to trust, to have faith in. And so let's focus a bit on trust. One of the best definitions I've heard of trust comes from Charles Feltman's The Thin Book of Trust. And I don't just like it because it's a thin book. He writes that trust is choosing to risk making something you value vulnerable to another person's actions. Trust is choosing to risk. Now that's important. Trust involves us making a choice, a risky choice. And so let's hear this again. Trust is choosing to risk making something you value vulnerable to another person's actions. So that same Gallup poll from 2019, only 30% of people trusted financial institutions, and yet I'd be willing to bet that most of us have chosen to risk making our financial well-being vulnerable to a bank's actions. It's an act of trust. When we fall in love and we trust our partner, we choose to risk making our hearts vulnerable to their actions. You ever risk your heart and lose? It's awfully hard to trust again after that, isn't it? But Jesus comes along and, and really asks us to risk everything for this good news, to risk 
everything for the kingdom, to risk our faith, to risk our love and lives, to risk our hope, to risk our very reason for being. When Jesus met those first disciples on the seashore with just a few words, he called them to risk all that they had. When Jesus saw Simon and Andrew fishing on the shore, come, follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. We read right away they left their nets and followed him. Right away they left their nets. They followed him. There was something about Jesus and about his call that in that briefest of moments, come, follow me. They were able to literally drop everything they had, their livelihood, their reason for being, their identity as fishers of fish. They dropped it all. And in the Greek, actually, it reads a little more like, I will make you become, become, I will make you to become fishers of people, become fishers of people, become something different, repent, change your lives, change who you are. It was one thing for Peter and Andrew to leave their nets, but James and John, the brothers Zebedee, they left their dad, their boat, their nets, their hired workers. I mean, if they had hired workers, they stood to inherit a little bit from their dad, from good old Zebedee. Quite a lot to leave behind if they were to go with Jesus. Quite a lot to risk. Quite a lot to make vulnerable to Jesus' actions. That's a lot of trust. And yet they followed him. At the very moment Jesus called them. Why? What was it about Jesus that instilled that level of trust that early in a relationship? Dr. Brene Brown has a helpful acronym for seven elements of trust that she's found in her research. These are things that lead to trusting relationships. And the acronym is BRAVING. BRAVING. And so here they are, uh, just short, briefly here. Number one in her acronym, B, boundaries, that you respect my boundaries. And when you're not clear about what's okay and not okay, you ask. You're willing to say no. When the rich young man wanted to follow Jesus, Jesus knew his boundaries. Are you willing to give up everything, Jesus asked him. And you've got a lot more than some nets on the seashore. It's like Jesus is saying, I know your boundary. But this is my boundary, just so we're clear. Number two, R, reliability. You do what you say you'll do. In Mark 9, verse 31, we read, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. Jesus does what he says he'll do. Number three, A, accountability. You know your mistakes, you apologize, and you make amends. Now, I'm not going to say Jesus, the perfect one, made mistakes. No. But while he doesn't make mistakes, he isn't heartless. He does hold himself accountable. You remember when Jesus tarried a bit with the disciples and his friend Lazarus died? We read, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was when he finally showed up and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She tries to hold Jesus accountable. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked, come and see, Lord, they replied, and Jesus wept, and he raised Lazarus. Again, he wasn't making amends, he was inviting belief, but he was so moved and troubled by the pain that he saw, he was accountable to what had happened. Now, V, Volt, you don't share information or experiences that are not yours to share. When Jesus is sharing in the Last Supper, he predicts that one among them will betray him. But he doesn't share who that is that wasn't for him to share. 
No, the one who would betray him had to own it. Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi, G Judas replied. Jesus answered, you have said so. Number five, I, integrity. You choose courage over comfort. You choose what is right over what is fun, fast, or easy. And you choose to practice your values rather than simply professing them. Jesus didn't just preach love, healing, and forgiveness. He practiced love, healing, and forgiveness. And he didn't choose comfort. He chose to be courageous. Father, he said, forgive them. for They know not what they do. Number six, and non-judgment. I can ask for what I need, Dr. Brown writes. And you can ask for what you need. We can talk about how we feel without judgment. Let him who is without sin, Jesus said, cast the first stone. And finally, seven, G, generosity. You extend the most generous, generous interpretation possible to the intentions, words, and actions of others. You remember after Peter, the rock, abandons and denies Jesus three times, what does Jesus do? He asks him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? It's like he's saying, I know that wasn't you. Denial is not you, Peter. You are love. You are the rock. And out of that generous interpretation, Jesus says, feed my sheep, Peter. From fisher of fish to fisher of men to shepherd of Jesus' flock. Peter, like many of us, may have faltered. But in the end, he trusted Jesus. He trusted Jesus with his life, his eternal life, trusted him enough to lose this earthly life. And Jesus trusted Peter with the gospel and ultimately with the church. There was something about Jesus that led Peter and Andrew and James and John to trust him and his good news there on the beach without a moment's hesitation. They chose to risk everything, risk making everything they valued vulnerable to Jesus' actions. And throughout his ministry, Jesus proved them again and again, proved worthy of them braving that risk of trust. Jesus, our model of strong boundaries, of reliability and accountability, a vault full of integrity, non-judgmental until he sits on that throne and a fund of generosity. Peter, Andrew, James, and John might not have experienced Jesus beyond those first moments, but they knew in an instant that he was worth the risk. And they left everything and trusted him. I don't know where in your life you need to learn to trust again, but I know that now is the time to begin to trust again. And I don't know any place better to begin to trust again than by trusting in the good news of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God has indeed come near. So I want to ask you, if you have risked your heart and lost, trust your heart to Jesus and learn to trust again. If you have risked your health with medical professionals and lost, trust in the ultimate healer and learn to trust again. If you have risked your livelihood to a business and lost, trust your life to Jesus and learn to trust again. If you have no trust in your country, your leaders, or the system, trust in the King of Kings and learn to trust again. If you have put your trust in organized religion and lost your soul, trust in the founder and perfecter of our faith and learn to 
trust again. Because the really good news is that the battles in life we face, all the battles, y'all realize it's a fixed fight, right? I mean, we already know the victor. We always have. It, it didn't take Bernie Birnbaum to spill the beans because it's written right here. Jesus wins the ultimate victory. And when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, we win the eternal victory. Now that's a fix you can trust always. That's some good news that you can trust. And I gotta believe it's the only place that we can truly begin to trust again. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, it is hard, all of us, in so many different ways. We have risked our hearts, our lives, finances, friendships, faith. We have risked putting them in the hands of others and we have lost, Lord God, and it is hard to trust. It's hard to know who to trust. It's hard to know where to trust. It's hard to even understand why at this point, Lord God, we have to trust anyone. So we come to you humbly, unsure of ourselves, but sure of you, and sure of your good news. So Lord God, help us, each and every one of us today, to put our trust in you, and to put our trust in your good news, that you never disappoint, that you never leave us high and dry, and as we begin to trust in you, O oh Lord, may our trust grow. May we find other places on this earthly life, in this earthly life, to place our trust. That you might be an example in all our lives and lead us to a foundation that lasts eternal. So it's in your name we pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I have decided decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. I do hope that Christ provides for you that foundation, that Christ and the good news of his nearness, of the kingdom's nearness to us, gives you reasons to step forward in trust, and that that might blossom beyond just Christ, but into the world as we live it today, that your decision to follow Jesus, to trust in him, might help you learn to trust and grow in other places as well. But I want to leave you with a reminder that when Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of people, that's a call for us to be trustworthy as well. Because Jesus entrusts with us the gospel. And so as we leave, I want to invite you to reflect on the seven elements of trust that Brene Brown revealed to us, and I'm going to post a PDF with them online here. You can download that. But ask yourself um, about your boundaries. If you are reliable, accountable, if you are a vault, if you have integrity, if you are non-judgmental, if you are generous, are you braving? So that you might ultimately be entrusted with the gospel. That others might see you and trust the gospel. So now as we leave today, 
We leave knowing that Christ and the hope. And so now as we leave today, we leave knowing that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one to be trusted now and for all eternity. And so as long as you walk with him, may you walk soundly. May you walk on a firm foundation that might grow into your lives as you can trust others and be trustworthy. God has trusted you with a great gift. Go and share the gospel. Amen. Though none go with me.